so we agreed, didn't we, just to have a conversation really about the rationale for having uh, an experiential group on the clinical supervision program. Mm -hmm. And this is the kind of second year that we're piloting this uh, development on the program with, you know, more of a creative edge to it as well with us working together on it. And I know that we we said that uh, we thought it might be useful for the group if we have a conversation discussing the rationale for such a thing. Um, and I, I, what I, what it threw me back into thinking about was about uh, twenty five years or so ago when I was uh, running counselling courses and I had to argue the uh, rationale for. Uh, running an experiential group on a counselling course. And I sort of feel somewhat back there in that way, but also sort of further developed, you know, with, you know, in relation to clinical supervision. So, you know, sort of why have an experiential group on a clinical supervision course? Um, so so that's that's where I sort of feel with it. And for me, perhaps the first argument for that is that we are learning in a group and therefore, we're having a relationship as a group and as a sort of small community, if you like. And therefore, there must be a space for that, an open space for that community to have open communication. So it's sort of like an open space. So yeah. for me, if if you don't, if you ignore that at your peril as well. So it's not only the cost of doing it, but it's the cost of not doing it. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll kick off with that. Okay, yeah, so I would, yes, I would add to that. Uh, it's what uh, I think Yalom calls the here and now. Always pay attention to what's going on in the here and now. So it's almost like there, there are parallel, there's a parallel process going on in that we have whatever it is we're talking about, discussing whatever is, is ostensibly consciously going on in the group. Mm -hmm. But there's also everything else that's going on in the dynamics of the group. And that's that's the here and now what's happening here between us. And that will happen in the same way in a in a supervision session. Um, so yeah. it's really I think it's really important to be always aware of, of that there are these these two things happening at the same time. Yeah. And the, and the space of the experiential group is such a good place to start paying attention to that. And I, I like you bringing Yalom in there because Yalom has a, a sort of, you know, his sort of humanistic, existential Yalom, that's what he called, but also quite psychodynamic in that sense. And of course, you know, the group, the models of the, the course are kind of quite person centered and psychodynamic. And, and when you talk about that going on, that sort of brings up for me the. Uh, what Bayern would call the task and the process, you know, so you've got that sort of the, the um, task focused work group, uh, a bit like people might think of um, their team that they work in. So you've got the overt task, which for us is, you know, learning about supervision. And then you've got the covert sort of process going on. So which is the whole unconscious sort of uh, process where, uh, the 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 task might get a bit sabotaged because there's there's all sorts of what they call the assumptions group going on, which is all about the different relationships in the group really and what what's happening. We can go into the more detail actually on the course, but you know just to say that there's a lot happening underneath that overt. But, yeah, and so if I think of myself sitting in a group situation, I will be attending whether this is a meeting or a supervision. Mm and maybe less so the supervision but there will be all sorts of things going there'll be the the obvious job that the that we're there to do yeah um, and then if I imagine myself sitting there with the little bubbles coming out of my head going I'm also going going you know bits of me will be thinking oh gosh I wonder if I look all right in what I'm wearing today and another bit of me will go I wonder that person just said that and that sounded a little bit um oh a little bit uh entering into some con conflict I wonder if that's going to develop now and I wonder if that's something I said that triggered that or you know there are all these other little dialogues going on because as you say it's all about the relationships in the group and sometimes when those those can become very powerful even dominant and they can completely take over in the group and I'm sure we've all been in meetings where the the job has simply not got done because of those relationships hijacking it 
Yeah, exactly. No, I think that that's a lovely example, actually, of the bubbles and, you know, what goes on in team meetings and, oh, the manager just said something to me then, should I take offence? You know, what's going on? And uh, yeah, yeah, be beautiful example there of, of how useful it is actually to look at the group dynamics, but at the same time, what's going on in the group, but at the same time, uh, you know, you can also understand that people feel uh, sort of cautious and wary about doing that, you know, because what what are we going to do, you know, if we open the can of worms and look inside? Yeah, absolutely. So, I, yeah, and I wonder whether that's a, I'm thinking now about about leadership. I think mm. we can you know come back. Yeah, and talk about yeah, that. go go for it. That, for me, that really brings up leadership because, as we all know, in a meeting where you have a good leader, the the meeting functions and runs efficiently. Um, where you don't, where there is conflict between leader and the group, or where there is a leader who is not handling the group dynamics very well um things can really go awry um and i think there's there's a in the settings of group experiential and i'll go back to my experience from training um, mm. we had a, a group of eight of us for three years our experiential group went on um but we had a member of staff was the group leader and i know at the beginning we felt very much led by her we were we were the we were the children she was the parent um we looked to her for approval we looked to her to to find out what's going on what are we meant to be doing here and over time that changed and we became much more of a peer group we had more confidence and respected ourselves and she drew back as a leader so she then became much more of a of an enabler and she enabled us all to step forward and take different roles and to um, own our, our place in the group, which we found really difficult at the beginning. We needed that leadership. So I think it's a very interesting, I think the role of leader is a really interesting one in relation to groups. Yeah, yes. And, and it sort of it made me think of a couple of things there. It made me think of... Uh, you know our you know another the reasons that we're we're offering the group uh you know for um the supervision group to experience themselves in in that sort of group and and grow in a certain amount of confidence and just by the two of us facilitating and enabling us to look at our being and not just our doing in the group in that sense but also what what is leadership you know so yes you described there a lovely example of a leader sort of you know sort of leading from the front and then moving slowly to you know backwards as it were or or back out of the the front uh, end of the group and and then the group naturally evolving to sort of take the leadership but that also you might argue in the present, you know, that different people in the group will take sort of leadership uh, at different times. You know, somebody might, for example, in the group that we run, uh, question the rationale and other people will follow them, you know, into that um, process. And and then, you know, different people will take up the kind of gauntlet in different ways. Uh, so the whole thing. Uh, is a debate throughout really about you know how are we understanding what's happening to us and different people will sort of almost pick up the I'm saying the gauntlet or the conch shell or whatever the the vision is uh, of the you know but take take some space to you know sort of invite you know take the discussion on a bit yes, so that's a form of leadership if you like you know which yeah. we would be encouraging yeah, in the group yeah Yes, and that's that leads into one of our other themes as well, doesn't it, of, of roles in groups? Yeah, yeah. How, how interesting, and I always find it really interesting in a group, how I myself, how I myself may surprise myself in, in how I behave in a group. So it may be really differently from the way I would behave in a one-to-one -one situation. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's something about filling that empty space <laughs> you're sitting around in a circle and there's this empty space in the middle and you know are you the sort of person who 
feels the need to jump in and fill it, you know, jump in and do a little dance in the middle or something or put something in the middle there? Are you the sort of person who really needs to break the silence or are you the sort of person who actually really can't bear to break the silence and absolutely doesn't want to be the one in the middle of the circle in the spotlight? Um, but being in a group in this situation, and it is a really artificial situation, the experiential group, we have to be honest about that. It's a very odd feeling sitting there in this group with no no fixed agenda, no, you know, no, no sort of no rules really. Um, and that's another interesting thing. How do groups develop the rules that they run by, whether they're explicit or implicit, mm. spoken or unspoken rules? Um, but but it shows us different bits of ourselves and it also gives us a chance sometimes to to try out a different role you know, or to respond to how other people may see us, which may not always be how we see ourselves. So I think there's that, there's that arena in which we can learn so much about ourselves um, yeah. in the context of, of those relationships. Yes, you made me think then of the value of feedback uh, in groups, you know, that that there may be ways in which I sort of behave in the group that um, until somebody else tells me that, oh, they were looking to me for that or uh, they, you know, or they found me a bit a bit annoying or or some something else you know when I thought I was had a different view of what I was doing you know where sometimes I might have perceived myself as quieter than I actually was uh, or other times when I may have perceived myself in a debate-like position but somebody took it as being quite aggressive or sometimes people didn't take it as I remember some one time getting feedback in a group where somebody said to me I was very measured I thought measured I'm like totally out there. <laughs> you know, I didn't see myself as measured at all, but you know, every everyone kind of nodded and and so I found that really interesting, you know, that 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 isn't how I perceive myself, but I quite I quite like that that piece of yeah. feedback. Yeah. There's know. a lot of, of learning in that sense, and that also makes me think about the psychodynamic element in that the way somebody else in the group may perceive you may have much more to do with their own stuff than with how you actually are. So I think that's a very interesting thing, particularly at the in the early stages of a group when when you can very easily and very often, particularly in the context of a training group uh, such as this, that the leader will will be in the role of parent or boss or some figure in authority, um, which then puts everybody else in the group in the role of of the children or the employees or the in, in some inferior role um and what that brings up for people you know people who've had really difficult relationship with their own parents or um or with siblings and what might go mm. on what might be reflected in the group in the here and now of the group plays out from people's personal histories from the there and then as it were yeah exactly. yeah that yeah so that what what really you're sharing different. there is yeah some of some of our past and our experiences of groups in the past mm. that we may enact some of that in the group mightn't we and that whole process of feedback uh, may may help us to understand uh, that we we might be um, making assumptions that uh, you know so and so reminds me, and particularly about the leadership sometimes. So as people are learning on the group supervision course about group supervision, and you know we'll we'll sort of look to our leadership uh, as well as each other's, and and you know, that we may remind them of people uh, who they may have had a mixed set of experiences in the past. And I think it can be quite exciting when people are willing to share a bit of that, although it can also feel a bit exposing too. But, you know, in, in the group, then witnessing that process and that being sort of talked about and shared a bit more openly, uh, it really helps the group to understand how that can sort of play out in any group, in, including, of course, their own supervision groups that they'll be leading subsequently, you know. And that makes me think it can also, if people um, can bring themselves to be open about this, mm. what things come up for them in the group, it can also offer a really wonderful opportunity for change. Because, mm. you know, we may be inadvertently standing in for someone's restrictive parent and we then may behave completely differently so you know it's a chance for someone to experience a relationship that felt like the same relationship and then to see actually it's not this relationship is very different 
So there's a great, you know, there's an opportunity to learn a lot personally, I think, from these groups. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, the sort of um, uh, when we I think of the process of transference sometimes as putting on a sort of a hat and coat uh, onto a person, you know, so the person looks like Uncle Fred. And then when we discuss that process, you know, the hat and coat comes off and the person looks like who, who they look like sort of thing. You know, that's just a. So when you, yes, you, you actually bring it back into the here and now and you say, well, actually, what's really happening here? This, is yeah. this a replay of that relationship or not? No, it's yeah. not. This, this is different. So yeah. a dance then between the here and now and the there and then can sometimes be taking place in the group, can't it, in that sense? Absolutely. And as you say, I think that can very often happen also in supervision groups. So if you are yeah. in the role of leading a supervision group, I think being aware that this could well be going on between the members of the group and the leader or between you know uh, between other people within the group and it can yeah yeah it, it's something to be aware of and and at time you know to bring to the attention of the group i think sometimes can be really helpful to do that as leader to bring, bring to the group's attention that there is something going on here yeah that is yeah definitely about the topic we're we're discussing and that might not just be us, might it? It might be other members of the group, or I might might invite the group to say, "What, what, what do you think is happening?" You know, can anyone sort of share their perception about what is happening? And sometimes it's kind of helpful to sort of pause and just invite the group to to comment, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. But I had a, a cheeky question come up for me here that I um I thought might might be interesting. So, you know, we've talked in some ways about leadership and and i i shared with you just before we started about my fantasy about you in terms of um i could you know because i i've witnessed you in in a group we've witnessed each other haven't we and um and me sharing with you that i saw you as as quite a leader but but that also i could see that you wouldn't necessarily perceive yourself in that way mm. you know and and you know so you sort of agreed with that and I I wondered what what kind of a leader did you perceive me you know and and what you know you know your feedback to me as it were in in that sense I don't know if there was anything uh, you wanted to offer there so I can make this quite quite personal to me <laughs> yeah yeah so I think I I think when when I first knew you leading a group um. I think you certainly had to con for me some elements of some past relationships I've had. Um, you're quite a quite a forceful, quite an animated uh, person. You're 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 very much a presence in the room, um, and for me that can at times be quite triggering. Yeah. But what I saw, so initially a little bit of that that. Yeah you know, came up for me a little bit of, I suppose, a little bit of fear, to be honest. Oh, is this someone who's going to, you know, kind of come down on me and expose me? So a little yeah. bit of that. But then I saw that uh, you were also very um, open, very honest, very, as a leader, very uh, transparent. I think very able to talk about what is happening for you in the room as well. There was no sometimes you feel a leader has a kind of a leader face a mask on and then that can come away and there can be someone quite different underneath but I didn't feel that with you I think as I got to know you I could see that this is you so I think we're, I suppose we're talking about congruence there you you are you in the group I, I feel you are you just as you are you anywhere else so um and I felt comfortable then in allowing myself to be me as well I think because I didn't feel that you were I didn't feel that you'd created a box into which you needed to put me so in that I think I think your respect for everybody in the group as individuals and for everybody's um right to come forward or not as they wish to to play the role that they needed to play within the group uh, and to observe and to comment, but not to judge. I think that came through. So in, the, in in that sense, I think you were a very Rogerian leader for me. <laughs> yeah. 
very congruent, yeah. non-judgmental, um, accepting and celebrating of everybody's strengths. And when there were issues, just throwing a light on them. So, yeah, that's how I think I saw you. Thank, thank you for that. And 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 I think, uh, you know, I remember some of our early encounters as well. And I think that, um, you know, for, for me, uh, you're, you know, though you come across and, and you are, I think, quite a modest sort of person. You're not somebody who kind of goes forward in the way that I, you know, I'm kind of a bit out there. Um, but you, you know, the comments that come out of you are very wise. And there were several times in the group where, you know, I, I'd felt, uh, challenged, um, appropriately, you know, by yourself in terms of the verbal and the nonverbal and, and what in some ways my expectation of the group was quite conversational, which yeah. then doesn't, doesn't allow for, so it's quite classic in a certain way you know people who communicate through other means or you know take longer to communicate or something would communicate and come into their own if we use slightly different methods yeah. so you know i really thought about that and thought yeah you know actually i'm i'm interested in us working in this sort of partnership way where you know i you, you have that you, you know that's something that's one of your strengths so, you know, I'm quite excited about how we're going to work together um, in that way and what you bring uh, as a sort of, I think we're sort of quite a sort of bit of a yin and a yang in, in, in a way. I think so, yes. And I, yes, I enjoy that. I think you are a very verbal person. <laughs> I would say yeah. you're very verbal. Yeah. Um, and I can be verbal too. I think I can be quite articulate. Oh, but um, as trained as an art therapist, so my... You know, I'm very comfortable in using a different medium for expression without words, although a lot of talking comes into art therapy too, but it doesn't have to. So, yes, I think there are so many ways of expressing oneself. Um, yeah. The verbal is just, was it 7% of our communication? <laughs> and I, aren't you also a musician and, you know, um, yeah. and, and you're also doing movement as well, you know, sort of, in in the other sort of work that we've shared so in fact there's there's quite a lot of strings yeah. to our bow I'm thinking <laughs> yes I think I suppose I'm very interested in all the creative arts and have at times in my life um engaged quite seriously in all of them I think yeah so yeah so I think although I love words and you know I also I, I've written in the past too so I I um I love words, mm. but I think there mm. is there are so many other ways of communicating, and I think it's it's really helpful not to ignore those ways, and also to give the space to people for whom words may not be you know, may not be entirely comfortable or maybe a bit threatening even. You know, yeah, yeah, mis misinterpreted, easily misinterpreted. Yeah. Yeah, and we can miss out, I think, because I, I mean, in in the times when I've done creative work with groups, you know, and I get to see uh, some of the the work that people do, um, it I always found find it extremely rich and rewarding, and often not not always, but often people who aren't terribly verbal in the group have a beautiful way of expressing themselves in another way, and you really get to, to sort of see that and appreciate that. You know, and I, I really like that, you know, additional dimension to the group. Yeah. And I think using creative methods can be so valuable because it can bring things up from our unconscious and bring them into our awareness in a way that talking or you know, thinking processes won't won't necessarily do. Mm. It could be a, it could be a shortcut to that certainly it could be a shortcut to the unconscious and when you look at what you've made and you and you then think about it you see something there oh my goodness I didn't realize I was feeling like that you know mm. that's what happens in therapy all the time but I think it's also really helpful to bring it into supervision and with my supervisees now I do use creative methods and it's it's usually really helpful for them they appreciate that so yeah yeah, no, certainly. So what would we both see as the potential cons 
as it were, of offering, you know, this kind of short term nine session uh, experiential group on on our, I think we, we've got about um, just over 20 weeks of actual teaching of which nine, you know, work into the group. But it's three groups of three. Um, yeah. So what do we see as the con the con side of, of doing this? Hmm. So I'm so much in favour of this. I find it really hard to think of the cons. Right. right. <laughs> I think it's a hugely valuable thing to do. Um, I suppose people starting out uh, may feel a certain amount of discomfort. You know, sitting around in this circle silently with no instructions as to what we're doing. That's a little bit, um, yeah, can be uncomfortable. And particularly at the beginning when you're in a group you don't know yet very well. I think you can all see that the, the mood of the group, the level of comfort changes enormously from the beginning to the end. Um, but at the beginning, those first sessions, uh, when people really aren't too clear about what we're meant to be doing here can be, be difficult for people. Yeah. It can yeah. be quite exposing, I suppose. It can be exposing in a way that until a level of trust, safety is built in the group can be difficult at the beginning. So I think that's where the facilitator and the leader needs to, to be watching very carefully to make sure that everybody does feel safe. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I yeah I, I and I think also what we were talking about before we opened this you know about the length of time you know both of us have been in long-term groups haven't we of, of various kinds and um so nine sessions you know is is sort of there's always like well what what can we do in nine sessions yeah we both feel that we can do something and and it'll be up to the the natural energy of the group and and what we can sort of facilitate within that uh, every group is different so you know it'll be up to the group as well to so sort of unpack and drive it forward so yeah it's I, I think the con for me is it, it is a short amount of time it'd be nice to always be nice to have longer but yet we uh, I think we have a lot to bring and uh, just like supervision really it won't go on forever you know, so what can we do in the time that we have together? Sometimes we don't always know that as, say, supervision group leaders, even of of how much time we'll get together. You know, things like COVID come along and suddenly stop everything. You know, there, there's times when we, we can be quite deliberate about it, but also times, especially in the NHS, where things get interrupted, people get hauled out and, uh, you know, we lose people for various reasons. So um yeah just yeah, so, yeah. so there's the risk that we'll do these nine sessions and people at the end will say well okay but didn't really get much from that what was that about um yeah I hope not I think but I think this discussion may be quite helpful in giving people some some little hooks to get to get into it and to start to explore what they can use this group for but yes every group as you say every group is different and we haven't even really got into talking at all about the group dynamics um the various theories around that and and how things work but i think that provided people are willing to to be themselves and to allow themselves to be seen in the group everybody will get something from it yeah Yes, and I think we've made some acknowledgement of the models through our talk about here and now and there and then, you know, so the, the notion of um, Yalom and uh, uh, Bayan. Um, uh, so we've got, you know, those are, those are so, some areas we'll, we'll also look at some other ways to manage groups as well, including, you know, structured uh, modelled approaches and so on. So there's the structured and the unstructured ways of managing groups. And I guess what my my ideal for people would be to come out feeling a bit more comfortable uh, inside a group dynamic and noticing what's going on uh, on the surface of both levels, uh, even if they may not yet be ready to do much with it, but they're there and they can sit with it and tolerate it and observe it. And then if they if they want to, they can take forward their learning with groups in a, in a range of range of trainings and so on. Yes, so, and 
for, for people who I know there are, you know, there are plenty of people who really feel quite uncomfortable in a group. Um, and I'm sure that will that will emerge for those people who don't like being in a group. Um, but it is an opportunity to to perhaps find some more comfort in 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 that role, you know, to learn that actually I can be in a group. Yeah. Um, yeah. Find new ways to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I would I I just hope that people will uh, throw themselves into it and embrace the discomfort of the first session. Yeah. Spread <laughs> <Rit> their teeth. <laughs> Um, and it will all it will all come to something in the end yeah 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 no it, it's always material you know whatever happens there, yeah. there will be uh, plenty of material for us to work with you know people fear that there won't but there always is so yes yeah. always stuff comes yeah. up you yeah. can't put, put a group of people in a room without there being stuff yeah yeah 